Hello, welcome. Today I'm going to come back to politics. I'm going to talk a little bit about immigration and what is happening in Great Britain. Uh, I'm going to mention um, certain things about, um, you know, in passing, um, some gentlemen here, Tommy Robinson, Elon Musk, Jordan Peterson, uh, Douglas Murray and so on and then I'm going to in the second part I'm going to talk about the United States I'm going to park that and go to talk about the United States and the different kinds of conservatism that we are seeing there now developing and that will bring me back to Europe and how we connect the two so a little bit about politics today okay it's on my mind so since I'm going to talk about immigration, let me begin by stating the obvious, and that is I am an immigrant myself, of the daughter of an immigrant, okay, who came here to England um, in the 60s. And I have talked about this in passing quite a few months ago, I think. So I'm going to tell you one or two anecdotes so that you see where I'm coming from in all the things I'm going to say. And if you have heard these one or two anecdotes before, um, keep quiet. <laughs> all right. So my mother immigrated to uh, England in the very early 60s. At that time, as you can imagine, it was all very, very different. They had to come with a contract that had to be signed and everything, okay? And they would give these um, poor immigrants contracts, mostly at the time, lots of them, to clean hospitals, okay? So my mother came with a contract as a janitor, as a cleaner, and the contract stipulated that you had to work in that area, in that sphere. You could change hospitals, but you had to continue to be a cleaner, nothing else. Okay, for four years. And at the end of that, it, will, it would be renewed. And then you could possibly, if it, they accept it, you could possibly then work in other areas. So, for example, if you knew the language, you could be a waitress or a secretary or something like that. Okay, but for the first four years, you had to do that work for which you were contracted to, to, to do. And then my mother brought my two brothers and myself. She had to ask, solicit permission, authorization and so on. Okay. And it was agreed. It was allowed. All right. One of the first things I remember, I had been here about two days. I didn't know the language at all. And I remember my mother saying, oh, there is our bus, our bus. And he had to run for the bus. And as we caught the bus, just about... I started telling her, oh my God, uh, we almost didn't make it. And of course I was speaking Spanish and my mother immediately said, shh. I didn't know what she meant. I mean, why aren't you allowing me to talk? And as we sat down, she said to me, don't ever speak aloud in public, especially in a closed place, in Spanish because it must be very uncomfortable for the people here to hear a language that they don't understand. Of course, we have to speak, but do it quietly. We have to respect the fact that we are guests and it is their country and they probably find it a little bit annoying. That was one of the first lessons that I learned to respect the fact that we were guests and she was always very grateful to England. It 
It was at a time when Spain had not quite yet recovered from the uh, from the civil war. Spain didn't have any martial plan or anything, so the, the, the country had to start, you know, from, from scratch. There were no jobs. So she was very grateful that she was able to work in something that she could do and earn wages every week. You were paid every week. Old timers, do you remember how we used to be paid in those days? Weekly, in cash, in a little brown envelope that had little holes. <laughs> I say this for the young people who think, when, when, what, what? <laughs> All right, we were paid in cash, okay. And she was very grateful that she was able to make a living. And she would work very, very hard, and she would work overtime. You remember overtime? You were paid time and a half. If you worked on Sundays, you were paid double, you see. So she worked very, very hard. And... As I grew, well, as I learned the language and time passed and so on, if I ever complained about England, politics, this, that, whatever it was, she would always stop me. She said, no, no, um, whatever is wrong, whatever things you may find wrong, they gave us an opportunity to make a living. You couldn't say anything against England uh, in front of my mother stayed here until she retired and then she went back to Spain and uh, not long ago, about 10 years ago, uh, she was just before she died in her 90s um, and uh, she had Alzheimer's and that. She, she didn't remember very much of anything but she did remember a few things. She wasn't completely all gone, you know. And one day, in order to just make her talk, just make her remember, I said, Mom, what was the bus number that you used to take from Wallington to Sutton in Surrey? She said, 54, number 54. You could take number 57, but that went around, sort of, not to the center of Sutton. It used to go to St. Helier and Morgan. But he didn't go to, and she gave me a whole explanation about the bus number 57 and bus number 54. 54 was the one to get. Okay. So I said to her, um, you remember England, don't you, Mom? You loved England. And she said, she, she looked for a while, she was thinking, and then she said, England was a mother to me, to all of us. Just remember that, always. So, I mean, that stayed with me, you know, so when, <laughs> even today, if I'm going to criticize something, whatever it might be, I kind of still see that wagging finger <laughs> uh, telling me to be careful and to be grateful. So that was the situation of immigration in the early 60s. Eventually, in 1973, I remember exactly because it was at the time, it was at the time when the currency was changing. You remember uh, from guineas and pounds and shillings and pence to the decimal that I decided that I would um, apply for British citizenship. And it was very easy, actually. I was working in a bank at the time, and at my, my lunchtime, I went to a lawyer. I knew what I had to do. I had to go to, the, to this lawyer, and I had to pledge allegiance to the Her Majesty the Queen and so on. The lawyer said the words. I repeated the words, and that was it. You know how much I paid? <laughs> 50 pence. 50 pence. I remember because it had just changed. So um, 50p, that's what I paid. I think it cost thousands now. Anyway, that was my personal anecdotes with, with immigration. Things have changed. They're not the same now. 
But I do remember, I want you to keep in mind, I say all this because I want you to keep in mind that those early immigrants were respectful and grateful to the country that allowed them to come in, make a living, and then go back, save a little bit of money, and perhaps be able to open a shop or open a bar or buy a little apartment, something like that, with the money that they had saved here. Okay, so what is happening now? We know that there was a continuous <clears throat> immigration, okay, but things changed uh, with uh, in the 1990s with Tony Blair. You've all heard it was done uh, on purpose and in order to create a multicultural society and so on and so forth. Okay. But the increase has been so great and so fast, millions of people, yeah, without the infrastructure really not changing very much. You know, the, the schools, the hospitals, the roads, the this, the that, haven't at all kept up with millions of people more. You know all the reasons. There was this thing growing, this feeling growing among the native population that this was too much, too fast. Complete change of, uh, of the society and people hadn't been asked. And whenever something was expressed, look, we don't like what is happening here. They were told to basically shut up or they were told, yes, we're going to do something about it. We are going to curb illegal immigration. We're going to do this and that for the last 10 years and nothing happened. And then Brexit, which of course was another cry to say, look, you know, this is going too fast, too much, too many. And even though the people made those thoughts very, very clear, to the politicians. Nevertheless, immigration increased. So actually there is a feeling among the population, we all know this, that politicians are not listening to it and we are seeing now that they are told, no, you can't. So when no one is hearing you, perhaps that is when, you know, demonstrations, even violence sometimes, no one is listening to you. How do you make them listen? And it is pretty much a national, uh, a, na a natural reaction when the people are not listened to or heard. And I never kept up with uh, this gentleman, Tommy Robinson. I knew that, um, he had complained or he had been complaining for a long time about crime. Uh, there was those cases of young um, English girls being um, abused and so on, yeah. Uh, but you couldn't talk about you couldn't talk about it. He was saying that there was a sort of a criminal mafia almost that he did all these terrible things in several cities and so on, but no one was listening. And on the contrary, he was accused of being a racist, Islamophobic, uh, because the, uh, the crimes were, the gangs were people from certain areas of the world and so on. Okay, you all know that. But he was being accused of being a racist and so on. Anyway, he ended up in prison. Um, and then they put him on purpose, it seems, in a prison which was peopled by the people that he, mostly by the people he had been complaining against, which was dangerous. Mm -hmm. In any case, in another video, I said, well, what is happening? Because he was always put down and silenced and not allowed to speak and imprisoned and all that. And all of a sudden, 
they are allowing him almost to speak out and there are demonstrations in the street following him and so on I said what is what is going on here okay is it i wondered aloud is it because during the woke period at its peak you couldn't say anything about uh, people from a different culture or a different religion or a different country and now that the general population is looking at Gaza, for example, and feeling that this is not right, what is happening to the politicians in the way that it is being done, could it be that this, they are, the powers that be, are allowing these demonstrations in order to put a lid on your sympathy for the Palestinians? I wondered aloud about that, but I couldn't put two and two together there. Okay, let me move on. I'm, I'm leaving things, you know, I'll connect the dots, hopefully, uh, at the end. So, at the same time, we see people like uh, respected intellectuals like Jordan Peterson and Douglas Murray, who... Uh, became very famous because they were both of them had something in common if they have something in common and they were very much against this wokeish movement yes about um uh, you know um you know in uh, what is it diversity inclusion all these man woman all that kind of thing they were very much they are very much against it And so I understand what they're saying. Douglas Murray, for a long time, he wrote that, uh, uh, perhaps 10 years ago, that uh, book about the death of Europe and so on, and Jordan Peterson, you, you follow him probably. Um, and I find that, on the one hand, I agree with their anti-wokeish um, stand. On the other hand, I cannot understand how they cannot see either of them, many more, but those two, um, that the way Israel is going about, uh, you know, what they're doing in Gaza, that that is wrong. Surely they see that it is quite a bit over the top. But they will not acknowledge that. They are both on the side of Israel. And I can't, I can't uh, understand how that can be. They are intelligent. Surely they see the evidence. I don't understand it. Elon Musk now is also seems to be uh, he, he's got he's got this thing also about being anti wokeish against the gender assignment thing. He said in an interview that uh, because of his son, who um, changed his sex and now is a woman and he referred to him as my son is dead and I'm going to do everything I can to put this wokeish um, you know gender people sort of I'm going to fight them that is what he said in an interview okay so what we have with these three people in particular is that they are all anti-woke and we know that the wokeish ideology is put there by you know it, it is it is controlled and directed it, that this is my opinion by the cabal the powers that be in order to break cohesion in society have the different groups fighting each other you know destruction of the family the destruction of this and all other things in other words to, for people to be uh, like individual 
atoms uh, by themselves and not part of a community, of a society, you can control the population much better in that way. But at the same time, this is my problem, at the same time that they're against this, which is part, which is a means by which the cabal exercise is controlled through the politicians, their assigned chosen politicians, they nevertheless are very much pro-Israel stance on Gaza. My point here is that I see Israel is not the um, cabal of the powers that be, but it's part of it. It's part of it. So I don't know how they can be against the one side of it and not the other. In other words, how they can be um, against anti-woke, which is the means that they use to keep control, global governance, and nevertheless be for, it's contradictory to me, for what Israel is doing and the way it is doing it. Let me park this thought here and now move, I'll come back to it, and now I'm going to move to the United States. I have uh, a lecture here given by, um, don't worry, I'm not going to, <laughs> to read you the lecture, just a few paragraphs. Uh, it's given by um, Professor John Fonte at Hillsdale, Hill, Hillsdale College uh, in Michigan. And uh, John Fonte is the director of the Center for American Common Culture at the Hudson Institute. And in this lecture, he said that there have been three kinds of conservatism in the United States. In very general terms, the first wave would be after the Second World War all the way to Reagan, kind of, okay? And that was, was it wasn't called American First yet, but it was called, uh, but it was uh, nationalistic and it was, you know, the United States, my country, pat patriotic. It was also a lot about economics and so on, um, small government, all that, okay? All right, then there is a second wave of conservatism, which starts really perhaps with the first Bush president, certainly then with Clinton in the 90s uh, increases, and that is when uh, all the deregulation of finance from, from national finance or international finance to uh, transnational finance. We begin, we begin to see now um, what they have been working towards that we were not able to see, but global govern governance being the objective. Yes, the big corporations well above the nation state. And that you could see, you could say something like, you know, the uh, we used to say the globalists against the sovereignists, yeah, the nation state. And then he argues that there is a third wave of conservatism now, and that is from Trump, really, from 2016. An attempt to, Trump may not have been very aware of it, but he was just going by intuition, bringing back all that globalist thing back to the nation state, back to the United States, back to uh, America first and all that. Okay, so a, a change on the emphasis, not so much the global power, but let's bring it back again to the sovereignty of the country. This is, of course, very general, okay? So what we had until then was the sort of uh, what they were called the neocons, okay, which were the ones, usually people say the ones pro-war, the ones who, you know, pro sort of American empire kind of thing. And 
the neoliberals who were the ones who took the not the economics but the cultural side of it the woke stuff and they were together working together using different roads towards global governance now he says the situation has changed and he divides them into the natcons national conservatives and the free cons the free <laughs> the free conservatives and he explains um the natcons he says um is a movement and is quite far powerful and it is developing actually in many of the think tanks in the United States. And they want to bring back a little bit of the, um, the emphasis on sovereignty, not so much 100% globalist, but let's bring back some of that wealth to the state. This is their statement. The NATCOM statement decries with alarm that the traditional beliefs, institutions and liberties that we love have been progressively undermined and overthrown. It calls for a restoration of the virtues inherent in patriotism and courage, honor and loyalty, religion and wisdom, congregation and family, man and woman, the Sabbath and the sacred, and reason and justice, as the prerequisite for recovering and maintaining our freedom, security and prosperity. This is kind of, uh, tra it sounds as traditional conservatism, right? NATCOM theory favors the sovereignty of democratic nation states over the authority of international institutions, the constitutional rule of law over the oligarchical rule of judges and administrators, a free enterprise economy that does not place abstract laissez-faire theories above concrete national interests, a moral order that honors religion in the public square, the traditional family supported by economic and cultural conditions that prioritize normal family life and child raising, an education policy that affirms patriotism and repudiates the contemporary academy a more restrictive immigration policy that emphasizes national interests, and a colorblind approach to civil rights uh, that opposes special treatment for any group, regardless of outcomes. NATCOM policies began to emerge during the Trump administration, the National Security Strategy document of 2017 emphasized strengthening American sovereignty and realistic national interests rather than adherence to international institutions and global rules. Okay. Um, all right. So... As I said, it sounds like traditional conservatism. And the uh, free conservatives, he explains that they continue to be the neoliberals, really. Um, not much change there. So there is n this new division. But of course, what do you do with the neocons who are, well, Are they on the side of the neolibs as up to now, up to now, or are they going to come to this side? Probably the former, because they talk more about empire, as it were. Okay, so what is happening then, putting two and two together, is that there is this new movement in the United States 
which seems to be now helping Trump, who, since the um, assassination attempt, people are wondering what is happening because he doesn't seem to be the same kind of individual, but not only personally, but in his policies too. And the fact that uh, apparently one Las Vegas um, multi-billionaire, I don't know that this is right, but this is what I heard in one uh, video, that um, she gave him, I think it's one billion dollars towards the campaign, if he would nevertheless continue to keep his um, approval of Israel, on the side of Israel. Okay, I don't know that that is correct or not. I I I heard it. I heard it from a very um, reasonable, sober, uh, you know, people here. But uh, anyway, so what we have, therefore, is that Elon Musk gave him also forty-five million dollars towards his campaign. A lot of billionaires are going over to this side of Trump that, let us say, still believes, I don't know whether as strongly as it did in 2016, but certainly still believes in make America great again, a sort of a sovereign, sovereign uh, nation state stand. So... What is happening then is that there has to be a sort of a division right at the top amongst the cabal, the people with power, the, the people with the finance, the people who rule the world. There has to be a little bit of a split there, those who still want to go full-fledged globalist and those who say, well, listen, Yes, okay, that is the objective, but perhaps it is becoming a little bit undone with this multipolar world coming up, and perhaps we should be a little bit more reasonable. In other words, we don't have to starve the, the, the indigenous population um, who will inevitably rise against it. And we can see that there is this, this, this thing growing, this thing bubbling so let us be realistic about it. And even though we do not disagree on the ultimate aim, perhaps the way we go about it is different. And that is these billionaires and, for example, the Nat Combs now, the National Conservatives, who might be going over to his side. But Israel is there, and even though they're, that's my point, If even though they're willing to accept more sovereignty and more traditional values, so to speak, I don't know to what extent this is a front or not, but in any case, they're talking about it. Nevertheless, they continue to support wholeheartedly what is happening in Palestine. And as I said, my problem with that is that to me it's not consistent because, as I said, to me Israel is part of the global elite. Um, I don't know exactly what, what, uh, what is happening here. Let's come back to Europe and the rest of the West. If this is so, the Europeans haven't got the memo yet. If this is so, we see uh, the governments in Europe not seeing clearly that there is now a split in the United States to bring back, to come back a little bit to more sovereignty. The 
individual independence to a certain degree of the nation state. They haven't got that memo yet. They're not aware because they continue to be as they were with going along the second wave, that second wave of, you know, transnational power, global power. So, how do I end this? Changes have to be coming in Europe. I know we know that the people are, you know, that that feeling that what is happening in Britain is happening in many other parts of Europe is there, is bubbling, is coming to the top. And it seems that the European leaders are still holding on to that second wave of conservatism, as I said. They will have to confront the fact that, as America is now doing, that they will have to come back a little bit more to the middle and start respecting the people of Europe the people in these countries, the people who do not agree with many of the policies that they are advancing, and they continue to advance. And there is no one in Europe who is standing up like, or standing out, like Trump did in 2016 in favor of the nation state. There is no one at the moment in Europe. One will have to emerge, but we don't see him or her yet. So um, here we are, waiting for God <laughs> That's it for today. I have no answers. I just have speculations and questions. That's all I have. Let me know what you think. Thank you. Bye-bye.